So I'm excited to talk about some of the work in my lab uh, here at UCLA uh, using integrative genomic approaches to uh, characterize the neurobiological mechanisms underlying complex psychiatric traits. Um, and so I am a psychiatrist um, by training and uh, I am really interested in studying uh, neurodevelopmental psychiatric disorders like autism and schizophrenia. Hopefully all of you have heard of these disorders. And one of the biggest challenges of studying uh, disorders of, of the brain and behavior is that we define them historically or they, they have been defined by um, behavioral symptoms, uh, things that are really, really hard to pin down or characterize in, in any rigorous quantitative um, manner. And just for, as an example, to meet the diagnostic criteria for an autism spectrum disorder in 2019, you have to have sort of impairments in, in multiple behavioral domains, including uh, deficits in social communication, uh, as well as repetitive behaviors. Um, but then there's any, a whole host of uh, other symptoms that kind of go along with, with these diagnoses that either are considered comorbid syndromes like ADHD or anxiety, intellectual disability, um, or just a huge amount of clinical heterogeneity. Um, and this is further challenged by the fact that there's not really a core defined pathology of disease. Uh, unlike diseases um, that are treated in sort of neurology or other fields of medicine, there's no biomarker that, that you can use to say this person has a diagnosis of autism or schizophrenia or anything like that. And even when you look at the brains of individuals with uh, some of these disorders, um, there's really not a clear distinctive pathology like you might see in neurodegenerative dis disorders like Alzheimer's, um, where the brain looks relatively normal and certainly not uh, abnormal enough to the degree uh, that one could make any kind of definitive statement about what, what's going on. And so how can we begin to make sense of this sort of complex mess or, uh, of behavioral symptoms and, and comorbid um, uh, associated um, features of disease in the absence of such a pathology? And, and for me, really one of the, the major um, uh, rays of hope is the fact that we, we, we have known for quite some time that these disorders are highly genetic. Um, this is uh, some recent data from the population in Sweden about the degree of risk for an autism diagnosis uh, as a function of how related two people are. Um, and I think Peter Vischer earlier this week did a really nice job sort of introducing the structural, uh, structural equation modeling that goes along with um, characterizing things like uh, trait heritability, um, and one can fit a, uh, a nice uh, line to the um, genetic relatedness of any two individuals and the recurrence risk for autism and, and quantify sort of the degree to which this, uh, this trait is heritable. Um, and I wrote a re recent review not too long ago, although I actually I think these, some of these numbers are a little bit outdated now, but the point of the matter is that almost all of these psychiatric traits that, I, that um, including autism and schizophrenia and things like bipolar disorder are highly heritable. Um, and so the proportion of liability for disease that's due to additive genetic factors that are inherited or passed on um, to affected family members or, uh, is, is usually larger than 50%, meaning that we can potentially use um, genetics as sort of a foothold for rigorous biological and mechanistic dissection of disease. So where is that genetic signal given that uh, I'm telling you that there's this hugely additive uh, heritable component? Well, it's taken some time uh, to, to find the genes, um, but now with uh, large scale uh, GWAS and sequencing studies, um, it seems like every day there's kind of like another GWAS or, or, or another um, uh, large scale study that comes out and identifies new risk variants uh, for disease. And, to date, there are now, I think, something like 245 genome-wide significant variants associated with schizophrenia, which has the largest sample sizes uh, um, to be able to detect these associations. Um, but uh, and other disorders, psychiatric disorders like bipolar um, and, and autism are um, lagging behind a little bit, but haven't been able to achieve these, these large sample sizes to the same degree. Um, in terms of sequencing studies uh, in, in autism, there are now 99 genes that are genome-wide significantly associated uh, with disease in terms of uh, carrying a, a de novo loss of function um, rare variant. So this is a, a loss of function mutation that's not inherited from either parent but gets uh, possibly due to a germline mutation or something along those lines that, that, that gets transmitted to a, a child and uh, leads to 
uh, autism or increased risk for autism. And the point of this is that there's lots of variants, there's lots of genes, there's predicted to be in the thousands. How do we make sense of all of this? How do, how do we figure out what, what in term, uh, the, the biology that's represented both in, in terms of the population as a whole, but also within an individual? And so some of the major challenges um, with this, uh, as I mentioned, there's this, a huge amount of, of polygenicity. So um, within an individual, no uh, single genetic variant is going to be sufficient to uh, cause disease. There's, there's no fully penetrant mutation that's been identified that um, associated with, say, autism or schizophrenia. Um, and uh, so it's, it's likely that hundreds to thousands of, of variants are gonna add up and, or interact within a given individual to uh, confer risk for, for disease. Um, and that's illustrated by the, the GWAS uh, plots that I mentioned before. Uh, in addition, there's substantial pleiotropy. So uh, the same genetic variants or, or um, genes have been associated with multiple, what we think of as distinct clinical phenotypes. And so um, one classic example are the large scale copy number variants like 22Q deletion syndrome, um, deletion of about 35 genes, I think on chromosome 22, that increases risk for both a diagnosis of autism and also a diagnosis of schizophrenia. Um, which have very different trajectories. One diagnosed, you know, age three or four, the other diagnosed around 25 to 30. Um, and so we really have a, a pretty poor understanding of, of how that happens. Um, and I think uh, some recent work from the, uh, our collaborators in Denmark have done a really nice job um, uh, illustrating this, this point, um, running a cross-disorder GWAS, uh, which identified a number of genome-wide significant variants that were broadly associated with multiple psychiatric diagnoses, including ADHD, affective disorder, anorexia, autism, uh, schizophrenia, bipolar. And that was done by Andrew Shork over there. Uh, and then finally, the, one of the main challenges um, is that even when we identify these variants, almost all of them, or, or a very large percentage of them, uh, lie in non-coding regions of the genome, where we have very poor understanding of what the functional impact is of a given genetic variant. Um, or we uh, also have, uh, if the region has a, a lot of linkage disequilibrium, which I'll show you in a second, um, it's, it's very hard to parse out what the causal variant is and what the causal effect is on, on disease. And so here, for example, is the top uh, GWAS association in schizophrenia. This is in the major histone compatibility uh, complex or region on chromosome six. Um, this being the sort of most significantly associated SNP, but what you can see is that everything above this, this genome-wide significant threshold here, there's, there's tons and tons of SNPs um, in a, in in about a megabase region that, that are all uh, very highly associated with, with disease um, being driven by LD. And it's been fine mapped and shown that the ultimate uh, risk gene or one of the risk genes in this locus is, is the C4A here, but you can see this whole mass of, of genes in the region that make it very hard to go from a genetic association to really understanding what the true biological impact is. And so how, how can we begin to make sense um, uh, of these uh, genetic associations um, in the context of these challenges that I've laid out. And so the approach that we take uh, and that I'm gonna talk about today is to sort of invoke the central dogma of biology. We know that um, DNA is transcribed into messenger RNA, which is translated into proteins and then leads to a hierarchical organization in the brain, in this case, by forming synapses and cells and circuits and, and then ultimately leading to behavior. Um, but our approach is to uh, work one step downstream from the, the DNA changes to look at messenger RNA, um, in particular what we call the transcriptome. It's a quantitative molecular phenotype. Now, why do we study that? Well, it has a number of uh, very attractive advantages, uh, especially when, um, when studying complex traits like autism. Uh, first, it's just in terms of the, the pure numbers, um, we can reduce the, the dimensionality of our, our search space from about 3 billion possible DNA uh, variant changes um, to the expression of approximately 30,000 genes uh, expressed in any given tissue. Um, in addition, we can um, move from a binary classification of a SNP to a, a much more rigorous quantitative metric of gene expression. Um, and we can make use of the fact that we know that genes um, often have uh, 
shared functions and, and there's a, a lot of a correlational structure within the transcriptome um, in terms of co-expression processes, which we'll talk about in a little bit later, that uh, can let us uh, gain further insight uh, into uh, some of the processes mediated by um, within the transcriptome. And the, the two main approaches that we take uh, when we focus on the transcriptome and, and using it to sort of gain insight into psychiatric disorders is um, forward genetic uh, approaches. So taking a known or what we think of as a, a known uh, disease associated genetic variant and trying to assess what its function is or functional impact in the brain by looking at uh, its uh, effect on gene expression. So in this case, something like a, a, a QTL. Um, or uh, taking a reverse genetic approach, which is um, contrasting cases and controls and identifying uh, regions of either differential expression or differential co-expression uh, to potentially gain insight into molecular pathology of disease. And hopefully by approaching this complex problem from both of these angles, we can uh, achieve something like a, a convergent biology or convergent understanding of the um, the neurobiological mechanisms that are, are underlying these, these disorders. Um, and when we look at the transcriptome, one of the key challenges is to know what the appropriate tissue is. And this has really plagued um, individuals studying psychiatric disorders for a long time because the brain, um, which may be the most obvious tissue, is also the least accessible. Uh, you can't really take a biopsy or, or anything like that. Um, and so people have tried to uh, use other uh, accessory tissues like blood or to make um, or to take fibroblast uh, biopsies and turn them into neural tissue. Um, but the, the main point uh, from this slide, this is from uh, Hillary Finnegan and Alcus Price's group, is that the main genetic signal under uh, a associated with schizophrenia and bipolar um, from, from GWAS is really, really strongly enriched for um, functional annotations in the brain, in the central nervous system. Um, and that if you really aren't studying the, the central nervous system tissue, I think uh, you're kind of shooting yourself in the foot in terms of um, being able to interpret the effects of genetic variation. And so we rely on postmortem human brain tissue to be able to achieve this, which is not perfect and certainly has uh, its own limitations, but, um, but has also uh, worked um, to a, a large degree pretty well. And so today, I'm, uh, my talk, I'm going to um, tell you about some recent work that we uh, have published recently as part of the Psych ENCODE Consortium, um, taking some of these forward genetic approaches to characterizing risk genes and mechanisms um, in brain, and then uh, talk a little bit about defining some of the molecular pathology uh, using this reverse genetic approach that I mentioned. And then if there's time at the end, a little bit of some uh, current work we're doing um, looking at isoforms uh, at the single cell level. So we are part of the Psych ENCODE Consortium, um, and this was uh, funded by the NIMH with the express purpose of trying to provide functional annotations to the non-coding genomic regions of the brain, um, where there was really poor understanding of what some of these sort of this dark matter of, of the genome is really doing. Um, and so the idea was to uh, get together uh, as large as possible a sample of uh, postmortem human brain samples um, matched for regions. So in this case, it's from the frontal part of the brain, the frontal cortex. Um, and then just to profile using a lot of different genomic technologies and try to integrate it together into a unified model. Um, and so we recently published a, a series of papers where we were able to compile about 2,000 brain samples together. Um, derived from about 1,700 unique individuals. Uh, and these were all profiled uh, for genotype um, data using SNP arrays as well as RNA sequencing uh, across a host of different labs and then uniformly processed together um, and, and analyzed uh, in concert. And these represent, um, a, a num about half of them represent uh, brain tissue from control individuals, um, so with no known sort of affected psychiatric disorders as well as uh, with several hundred um, affected by either a diagnosis of autism, schizophrenia, or bipolar disorder. 
Um, and we tried to be as inclusive as possible in terms of other known uh, covariates or, or uh, factors that we think thought might in influence gene expression. So we captured a very broad age range, in this case, the full spectrum uh, of postnatal life from zero to 90, um, as well as uh, gender balance and, and, um, and things, uh, other covariates along the lines. Um, and for those of you interested in using this data or looking at what's available, um, we've created a, a website called resource.psycenco.org that has a lot of the summary statistics readily available for, for anyone that wants to use them. And so the first question is, can we compile and integrate the genotype information with the RNA-seq data to create a, a large-scale eQTL resource? Um, so GTEx and, and other large-scale um, uh, consortium um, have been generating these types of data, but almost all of them have very limited number of brain samples. And one of the things that we've realized, or, or uh, and that's that's become quite apparent, is that sample size makes a huge difference when you're looking at small effects from common genetic variation. Um, and so we combined the you know 13, 1400. Um, samples that had uh, combined genotype and, and RNA-seq information together to uh, assess um, and quantify uh, cis-EQTLs um, for both protein coding and non-coding genes. And what we identify is about 30,000 e-genes. So pretty much every gene that's expressed in the brain has, uh, has an identifiable eQTL. Um, and again, th this information is, is now publicly available on the PsychEncode website. Um, and if we contrast that to what had been previously published, either through the Common Mind Consortium, which had a sample size of slightly over 500, um, we detect about twice as many eQTLs uh, in our data set. Um, and then also compared to GTEx, which had about 150, at least in the V7 release, um, uh, in terms of the number of, of brain tissue samples identified. That being said, um, even, uh, even though we identify a, a, large, a much larger number of, of e-genes and eQTLs, there is a, a substantial overlap uh, in terms of consistency with what had previously be, been identified either in Common Mind or in DTEx um, with a, a highly reproducible uh, pi hat um, concordance value. Um, and, uh, and we find that about 50% of the eQTLs identified in other tissues are, are also present in the brain, which is largely consistent with what, with what has been published um, in GTEx and, and other uh, resources. So what can we do with this large-scale eQTL resource? Well, the major interests um, that, that we had was uh, to take these eQTLs and to leverage this information to begin to annotate non-coding GWAS signal. So we know that about 90% of GWAS hits are, are in non-coding regions of the genome, and so perhaps these represent things like, like cis eQTLs in either promoter or enhancer regions of the genome, and perhaps we can sort of integrate these two pieces of information together to gain insight into what the biological mechanism of an under, underlying uh, GWAS uh, variant or, or uh, effect might be. So here I'm showing you a, a GWAS locus um, in schizophrenia. Most of the examples I'm gonna show you are based on schizophrenia just because the GWAS um, sample size is, is large and um, so it has sort of the most power to, to demonstrate these types of approaches but would be readily applicable to almost any complex trait affecting the brain. Uh, so this is a, a large scale um, a GWAS association on chromosome 18 in schizophrenia. Um, you can see that there's a large um, block of, of linkage disequilibrium such that all of these SNPs in this region are considered genome-wide significant, although they likely represent only a single or, or a small number of causal variants, um, but really spans like 500 kilobases. Um, and uh, there's a number of genes in this region. In this case, I'm, I'm just showing you one of them that has a QTL signal that we detect, and we can run a host of association uh, or co-localization statistics to, be to begin to assess whether these two signals uh, correspond or, or overlap with each other. And so we took a number of approaches, and I thought um, uh, Hakim did a really great job uh, summarizing um, the, the different types of uh, QTL GWAS integrations in, in her tutorial um, and looking at association based, based methods like, like TWAS or summary based Mendelian randomization um, as well as 
uh, co-localization based methods like coloc or nloc. Um, and then I'll also talk a little bit about um, using polygenic risk scores and, and uh, chromosomal confirmation capture um, as another way to sort of overlay signals and, and gain insight. So this is um, another schizophrenia GWAS uh, locus, uh, in this case on chromosome 8. Um, and here's the, the GWAS signal with, with the largest uh, association around here. Um, and there's a, a fairly large LD block. Um, and so one way that we can begin to map these GWAS SNPs to potential regulatory effects on uh, nearby genes is to look at the physical binding um, of the, the actual chromosome or the physical, physical proximity of the chromosome um, and its looping structure uh, that's formed during gene regulation um, in brain. So we, um, as part of the Psych ENCODE consortium, we generated uh, a number of, of high c um, libraries or high c maps, which uh, basically map the physical or proximity or physical binding interactions um, as the chromosome loops uh, around and, um, and uh, engages in gene regulatory activity. Um, and so we can actually leverage the, these chromosomal contexts to say, okay, we have a, a GWAS SNP here, um, and even though in a linear distance it's far away from this gene, in this case this is the alpha-2 nicotinic receptor, um, it, it does, it's, it's um, in close physical proximity in three-dimensional space. Um, and it's been recently shown pretty elegantly that, that linear distance uh, on a chromosome is actually less important than this, this 3D structure, this 3D looping structure um, that, that can be quantified with these um, chromosomal confirmation capture technologies. And so we're able to annotate this GWAS uh, hit in schizophrenia as um, the genome-wide significant associated variance is actually in physical uh, proximity to the promoter of this, um, this nicotinic receptor which is further supported by uh, transcription, fa transcription factor binding site activity. So this is one way that we can go from non-coding association to finding a target gene of action. And uh, one of the psych ENCODE papers um, from, from Dai Fan Wang and Mark Gerstein's group uh, really systematically went through and assessed uh, all of the potential uh, enhancer uh, promoter physical binding uh, through high c and, and created a, a pretty comprehensive map from an adult brain uh, to, to query these types of associations. In addition, um, we can leverage statistical functional uh, associations. So in this case, um, perform a, an association test like a TWAS approach. Um, and a, a bunch of other folks have uh, hopefully introduced um, this, this topic. Uh, so. Uh, I'm not going to spend too much time going over the, the details, but um, and, and, um, you know, it's really Bogdan uh, Pasanuk's group and, and Sasha Gusev have really been instrumental in developing this method. But essentially the idea is that you take your, uh, your tissue-specific reference panel, so in this case our, our 1,300 um, postmortem brain samples where we have both gene expression measures and G, uh, SNP, um, SNP genotypes, and use a, a sparse um, um, lasso or elastic net regression to uh, link nearby uh, cis um, uh, single nucleotide polymorphisms to expression um, and to, to uh, expression of nearby genes. And we can create this, this SNP gene feature matrix um, that we can then impute into the um, the GWAS summary statistics to infer what a trait uh, association with gene expression would be, um, at least in terms of its cis components uh, in brain. And this is conceptually very similar, I think, across a number of different methods like TWAS, also predict scan and, and summary based Mendelian randomization. And they all have the benefits of being able to give you a very interpretable association signal between uh, a, a GWAS and um, a, G, a GWAS. Uh, association locus and a nearby gene uh, and its effect the direction of regulation. And so I'll show you what this looks like for schizophrenia. So this is sort of the equivalent to the Manhattan plot uh, in schizophrenia, um, but in this case we have a TWAS z-score for every gene that's expressed in the brain that had a heritable degree of 
um, cis-regulated expression. So there are, I think, 14, 12, 13 or 14,000 genes which were significantly heritable in our data set. And so for each one of those, we identified the SNPs uh, in the cis region that were most predictive of expression uh, and then imputed uh, that into the schizophrenia GWAS summary statistics to create a z-score of either predicted upregulation of that gene's expression in disease or downregulation of that uh, gene's expression in disease. And with this approach, we identify 193 candidate risk gene associations. Um, and again, with a, with a directionality a, a, of association, which can be quite informative in terms of its effect in disease. Um, now, uh, some other folks I, I have brought up some of the, the challenges um, in terms of uh, interpreting some of these associations because it is an association test. Um, we don't, it's, it's not necessarily giving you a, a causal, um, causal effect. And so to address some, um, some of those concerns, what we can do is um, actually perform a, um, a sort of a stepwise regression and, and characterize which of these associations in a given locus are conditionally independent. And so if because of like say a large LD region, um, there are multiple associations in, in one uh, region with, with a number of genes, we can figure out sort of what is the minimal set of genes that explain this GWAS signal um, that are, that are uh, conditionally um, independent of each other uh, and then restrict our kind of uh, reporting to, to these sort of conditionally independent associations. Um, this was the this was implemented in the TWAS uh, fusion package, and then since then, um, Nick Mancuso and Bogdan's lab uh, have come up with a, a probabilistic fine mapping approach that um, takes a slightly different uh, Bayesian uh, approach towards fine mapping these associations, but um, we find that this is extremely helpful in sort of pruning back some of the associations that you get from TWAS or, or related approaches that may reflect just large scale linkage disequilibrium in, in a given locus rather than actually a true association uh, with, your, with your trait of interest. And so what you can see, um, just going back to um, our, our TWAS sort of Manhattan plot is that there are, are a lot of regions like right here where there are these sort of faint or, or blurred out um, dots and those represent sort of conditionally dependent signals. And so we didn't, um, we didn't attribute those to disease and only uh, label the, the points that were, uh, the genes that were conditionally independent of each other. Um, some of the lessons, so from, from this we identify 107 conditionally um, independent associations with schizophrenia, a lot fewer in bipolar and, and autism, just given the sample size of the GWAS. Um, but we can make some interesting, um, gain some interesting insights into the biology of disease from these results. So firstly, uh, we find that many uh, TWAS associations are um, to, not, not only are they based on non-coding SNPs, but they're actually associations to non-coding genes. So these are link RNAs, pseudogenes, uh, snow RNAs, um, these are all these types of genes that don't actually make a protein product but are important for gene regulation, particularly in brain. Um, and so I'm just highlighting one example here. This is a link RNA link 00634, um, which is um, very predominantly expressed in brain. So this is data from GTAX showing you expression levels across, I think, like 60 different tissues in human. And what you can see is really only expressed in these yellow tissues, with, which represent brain. Um, or, or, or CNS um, tissue types, and then maybe a little bit like testes and pituitary and nerve, but these are also sort of like related to the brain. Um, so this is a non-coding gene, highly expressed in brain, but not other tissues, um, that significantly um, is associated, it, it's, predicted uh, ex it's predicted to be genetically upregulated in, in schizophrenia, yet when we want to begin to gain inference into what does this mean um, biologically or what are further mechanisms, if you go to PubMed and you type this, this gene in, you get zero hits. And so I think this is a really interesting ripe area for, for you know, mechanistic follow-up in uh, neural stem cell-based models or, or things of, of that nature. And so we provide a, a list in our, our paper of 
all of these link RNAs that are um, genetically predicted to be associated with disease, but then also are specific to certain organs like the brain or that are evolutionarily conserved um, or uh, using other sort of metrics to infer how important they might be for, for the disease process. Um, so one challenge, like I mentioned, of, of TWAS is that this issue of, of LD um, uh, and sort of pervasive linkage disequilibrium. And one thing that we noticed um, and that I think is important to recognize when you're trying to infer associations through these, these types of methods is that you really, you can only get what you put in. It, and what that means is uh, a lot of TWAS or SMR or co-localization methods, first of all, like they only put in protein coding genes or they only look for EQTLs in protein coding genes. And so if the actual association of the true causal effect is with a non-coding gene, if you didn't put it into your model, you're obviously not gonna find it. Um, but we also know that our annotations are constantly being updated and constantly being improved and, um, and our genomic annotations are particularly poor for, for um, tissues like the human brain. They're usually much better uh, studied in you know, peripheral tissues in, in, in human body, but, but the brain seems to have kind of the, the least sophisticated uh, set of annotations, uh, at least in my opinion, in things like GenCode or, or RefSeq. Um, and so here I'll give you an example. So this is a schizophrenia GWAS lo locus uh, on chromosome three, very large LD block. Um, the, the blue signal I think is European schizophrenia association, and I think the red one is in China. Um, so I plotted those to see if there was any sort of distinct LD uh, based on ancestry, but they look pretty similar. Um, there's this big, big LD block here. And we had previously shown um, that this GWAS locus, uh, when we, we find mapped the SNPs in this region and identified a number of what we call credible ca uh, causal or credible causal SNPs. So these are uh, find mapped and have um, I think greater than one or two percent uh, posterior probability for association. And so um, this is one of those SNPs. And we had shown before that this SNP is in a high C interaction with this gene SOX2 over here uh, in fetal brain. So this is a significant association between this SNP and the promoter of SOX2. And so we sort of inferred from that that this is likely to be the mechanism that is underlying this association. And, and for those of you who are not familiar with SOX2, it's a master transcription factor regulator. It's important for um, developmental, um, for, for neural development, um, and it's been pretty well studied. So then we come along with our, our larger psych encode EQTL resource, and we find that there's another gene in this region, this one FXR1 here, which shows a significant TWAS association and a significant uh, association through summary-based Mendelian randomization. <laughs> and so the question is now, do we have you know, two possible associations or one? It's, it's really hard to know. Um, and then this is all based on some of the gen code version 19 annotations. Um, and then all of a sudden, as, you, uh, as the annotations get updated, um, there's another gene that gets added to this locus. And this is a non-coding gene called SOX2OT. It stands for SOX2 overlapping transcript. So literally SOX2 is actually like in, within the introns of this gene. Um, but it's this really large link RNA that for whatever reason wasn't annotated previously but then got added to the annotations. And one of the interesting things is sort of the length of this, this gene, at least on the 5' prime end, seems to sort of span a lot of this GWAS association. Um, now, I'm not here to tell you which one of these associations is, is sort of the causal mechanism underlying the trait uh, associate, or which one of these genes is the sort of causally underlying this, this trait association, but you can make an interesting story for almost anything. Um, and so if we look at this gene SOX2OT, we find it's actually very similar to that other one I showed you, very strongly expressed only in the brain or, or highly in the brain. It's heavily spliced, so there's 104 different transcript variants, uh, isoforms that are uh, present in, in the brain, or that, that, are, that are annotated now, um, suggesting that there's a lot of complex regulation going on there. 
it's capped, it's polydentylated, even though it doesn't make a protein product, um, it's strongly conserved in uh, model organisms, including mouse, and um, involved, shown to be involved in, in mouse neurogenesis. And if you look, if you zoom in on some of these associations here, what you'll actually find is that some of these schizophrenia association uh, GWAS variants actually change the kind of exonic um, uh, transcribed regions of SOX2 OT. So even though it doesn't make a protein, so we can't say it's changing like an amino acid, it actually changes the base pairs of this link RNA, which could potentially affect whatever its regulatory function is. Um, and so, you know, I think that, that a lot of these um, sort of raise questions about how to begin to interpret uh, the specific mechanisms uh, at each one of these um, loci. Um, we also looked at other methods like Mendelian randomization um, with its Heidi test, which had been, I think, mentioned a little bit earlier in the week um, and developed uh, by, by uh, Zhang Yang and, and Peter Vischer and Naomi Ray. And again, very similar type of approach of correlating the effect sizes of EQTLs with the effect sizes that, um, of, of the GWAS association um, for, the, for matched pairs of SNPs. And fitting this, this line and this line um, crosses zero, uh, it shows a significant association. So the, um, the more likely this SNP is to be a GWAS association, the more likely it is to downregulate the expression of this gene. In this case, it's set, uh, set D8 and set D6. And why are these important? Well, uh, we find that these genes are also a really strongly downregulated uh, in schizophrenia. Um, if we just do a case control association analysis, um, both of them are, are significantly downregulated in expression in schizophrenia. Um, one of them is also downregulated in bipolar disorder. Um, and we know that there have also been rare variants in very similar genes that are also histone, lysine, methyl transferases. In this case, set D1A is another gene that's been um, genome-wide significantly associated with schizophrenia in terms of harboring a um, loss of function a de novo uh, mutation. And so it begins to give us insight into this mechanism of the uh, histone methyl transferase or, or just chromatin modification in general seems to be uh, a, a very involved in, uh, in these psychiatric disorders. Um, and then finally, uh, the other way that we thought about trying to um, identify potential mechanisms is by fitting polygenic risk scores to all of our uh, cases, or all of the individuals that we had uh, matched genotype and RNA-seq data for. And so the idea here is that instead of looking within a specific QTL region or around a given gene or, or anything like that, we're just gonna fit polygenic risk scores for, say, schizophrenia, for bipolar, for autism, within our 1,000, 1,300, um, samples. And we're going to say within each sample or across these 1300 samples, are there any genes that significantly correlate with the polygenic load for these different traits? And this is uh, a, a way to potentially begin to identify um, sort of trans effects or, or, um, or other forms of, of regulation that might not be picked up or that has different um, assumptions than sort of co-localization based QTL or, or Mendelian randomization approaches. And we actually did identify uh, a number of genes that were either significantly associated with uh, increased polygenic risk or that were downregulated with, with increased polygenic risk, um, mostly in autism, which was surprising given that autism actually has the sort of smallest GWAS association signal. Um, these are all uh, Bonferroni corrected uh, for the millions of comparisons that we had to do to um, get these associations. Um, but just as a nice sort of proof of principle, what we find is that the top associated gene for schizophrenia is this gene C4A, which, we, which has already been validated by, by other groups at the, the Broad Institute and others um, as being a, a very strong uh, risk gene for schizophrenia. And in fact, we were able to identify um, the, uh, that uh, copy number, uh, structural copy number of, of the uh, C4A gene is in fact associated with um, expression uh, in our data set, um, very strongly replicating what, what these previous uh, people have found. <laughs>
And so we, um, you know, we tried to pull together a number of different ways to leverage this large scale data set that we have to gain insights into what are the specific mechanisms underlying each one of these GWAS um, loci. And I just was thinking like, what are you know, some major take home points that we, we find when, when doing these associations? Um, first, we find that, that maybe not surprisingly, the tissue and specifically the, the sample size um, both make a huge difference. So if you have uh, a non-brain tissue, you're gonna miss out potentially on a lot of these brain specific link RNAs or non-coding RNAs. And, and then the sample size for the QTL is especially important because um, we see for example, just using GTEx um, brain tissue that the, um, there's many, many fewer associations. And so it's really important to you know, get the, the largest uh, matched uh, sample uh, that you can find. Um, these RNAs, non-coding RNAs are important too and are, are often thrown out and maybe not for good reason. Um, many of them show tissue specificity and evolutionary conservation and, and a lot of sophisticated um, post-transcriptional uh, uh, processes and making us sort of think that they may be much more um, relevant for, for disease than perhaps was uh, previously appreciated. Uh, and that you only get what you put in. So if your gene was not considered heritable in your data set or um, was, uh, was not, um, was, didn't have a, a, an EQTL above the threshold for inclusion, then you're not gonna get that association, but that doesn't mean that it's not associated. Um, and so I haven't seen a whole lot of methods that actually include like a null model or, or a null association, um, but I think that that's, it's quite important um, potentially for, for knowing whether that's the case or not. Um, most of the genes that do get prioritized are not the closest genes. And so if you go back and you, you take the, the top GWAS association, and you say, what are the genes that are in or around this this region, um, the one that gets prioritized is really often much farther away than the, the closest one or, or it's not, not within the gene, um, even though many methods currently um, annotate uh, SNPs to genes based on physical proximity. And so maybe that's not the, uh, maybe about half the time that's gonna uh, be right, but about half the time it's, it's gonna give you the wrong, um, not prioritize um, the most significant uh, associated gene through, through these other methods. Um, and that many of these have different assumptions or limitations. And um, so I showed you some about the sort of conditionally independent signals for, for TWAS, um, but also mentioned that many of these methods use different types of normalizations for either covariate correction. So like the QTL methods, I'll use like a lot of peer factors or, or principal components when they're included, uh, included in their gene expression regulation that maybe not included in differential expression analysis or, or others, and some of them use you know, kind of quantile normalizations and things like that, that, that can lead to different results. And I think it's important to begin to understand um, that, that these things make a difference. And, um, and then finally, that, that there's uh, a lot of strength and support uh, across multiple methods. And so if we see a gene that is you know, predicted to have a downregulated TWAS, uh, and we also observe it to be differentially expressed or, or to have a high C interaction, that we think that, that it's more, much more likely to be a truly causal uh, risk gene than, than something that only has one association or, or, um, or is not conditionally independent. Um, and then one thing I haven't talked about uh, is the issue of cell type and timing. Um, there's a lot of push right now to generate single cell maps and to do single cell sequencing. And a lot of folks now um, in PsycheNCode are, are doing this for brain tissue. Um, and I think that's it's definitely going to be important. Um, my one caveat is just that the, uh, the sample size is such a big difference that, that doing this in a way that sort of le maximally leverages the, the number of unique individuals that you can profile will be quite important. And to date, that's not sort of financially uh, or cost prohibitive, um, but hopefully as, as sequencing costs and, and single cell costs come down, perhaps it'll be uh, possible to do this in a very uh, robust and large scale way. Um, and one thing people don't often think about, but that also makes quite a big difference is the, the timing um, or the developmental context uh, in which um, regulation might be occurring. So we were looking at uh, post-mortem brain tissue from, from adult individuals, um, but a, uh, 
at the same time, a, a, post, or a graduate student in the Geshwin lab, uh, Rebecca Walker, um, was, was doing a similar analysis in, in fetal brain tissue. And so um, just as a quick aside, we're, we're able to contrast the timing, the sort of developmental regulation um, of, of uh, EQTL and, and gene expression integration with GWAS to see sort of where the largest um, overlap seems to uh, lie. And, I'll, and so Rebecca um, ran RNA sequencing on about 200 uh, fetal brain samples from the mid-gestation period, so around 17 to 22 weeks uh, post-conception. Um, and then we also measured uh, SNP uh, genotypes from the same samples and able to basically do a very analogous experiment um, or uh, analogous approach to the, the psych ENCODE consortium, but except that we're looking in, in fetal brain and identify the QTLs that are either specific to fetal brain or specific to adult brain or shared between the two, and then begin to look at where do you see the enrichment of the genetic signal for, for these different complex traits like schizophrenia. Um, and Remarkably, uh, we find that the fetal EQTLs capture a much larger degree of enrichment for schizophrenia uh, GWAS um, than the adult-specific QTLs here. Um, and um, if you plot the enrichment um, using LD score regression as a function of the sort of size around the window, um, you can see that the, the fetal brain really captures a, a lot of um, a lot more of the signal than, than the adult brain, although there is still a strong enrichment in the adult brain as well. Um, and so with that, um, I want to um, thank everyone for their attention. Um, I know I kind of ran a little late, and so I'll, um, I just want to pull up uh, my, uh, thank, um, all the members of, of my lab um, and the Geshwin lab who, who uh, worked to put together a lot of this um, data as well as our, our collaborators through the Psych Encode Consortium. It's a, it's a very large uh, collaborative effort of you know, over 100 different investigators uh, compiling data resources um, and just slogging through a bunch of conference calls every week um, as well as collaborators uh, at UCLA and, and the folks that, that donated their, um, their brains to make this happen because that's also the most important thing is that if people don't sort of donate their tissue or, or brains, we, we would not have been able to do this. So thank you.